a biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. Well, it's no secret that some of us might try to avoid difficult conversations. It's usually because we don't always have the confidence to deal with difficult concepts, situations or even people. Or we don't have sufficient training or expertise to handle controversial topics. In recent times, things have become even more complex as people can be very easily offended. But it's good to remember that Jesus was always comfortable having difficult conversations. So we can pray and aspire to this too. Ralph Esterby is the National Director of Chaplaincy Australia. And he's also the Coordinating Chaplain for the Australian Army. He's a gifted communicator and a passionate leader who believes that Christ has answers for every life and that true fulfillment can only be found in him. Ralph, welcome. Thanks, Andrew. It's great to be with you today. Ralph, it is great to be with you. Now, I want you to tell us all about your role as National Director of Chaplaincy Australia. Uh, Andrew, I've had this a fantastic opportunity for the last 10 years to be the National Director of Chaplaincy Australia, which is the chaplaincy arm of the Australian Christian churches, but it's open to membership from all denominations, any Christian denomination, uh, anyone from a Christian denomination can come and join us as a chaplain. We have chaplains in every state. Um, We have currently 600 chaplains across the country working in 27 different sectors of the Australian community and making an amazing difference and being there and available for people on their worst day to stand with them and to just offer love and and absolutely uh, uh, free and, and un, unfettered care as they need it. I love it. And so you're the National Director of Chaplaincy Australia. How many chaplains are involved in Chaplaincy Australia? So as I said, we have 600 current chaplains across the country. So um, we have... Uh, two different levels of chaplaincy. We have a, an associate, which is someone who's either just starting their journey in chaplaincy and done some training, and then we have a full um, qualification, which is chaplain. And that that individual has been fully trained and is accredited and is well tested and tried and is able to help people in whatever segment of society they go into. We call them sectors, and we have amazing sectors. We have people working in schools. We have people working in prisons. We have people working in the ADF. We have pe- uh, chaplains on cruise ships. We have chaplains in um, workplaces. We have chaplains in uh, soup. Uh, Uh, shopping centres. We have chaplains pretty much wherever you can find a group of people, we would like to place a chaplain. Okay, so you've got 600 chaplains across Australia. Are these chaplains all self-funding? They have to raise their own finance or are they paid by Chaplaincy Australia? How does that work? So it's it's a bit of a mixed bag there, Andrew. So um, the majority of chaplaincy in our network is uh, has a voluntary aspect to it. So where where a lot of these chaplains are uh, volunteering their time, um, they they have other jobs and they do this as a as a side a side uh, activity, a side ministry. Um, but progressively, chaplaincy is becoming professional uh, and is having a professional outworking. So we have a number of chaplains who are employed in full time capacity, and they are. Uh, serving organisations, businesses, not-for-profits, various groups, and providing them with chaplaincy. The training is the same for uh, volunteer chaplaincy and for paid chaplaincy, but the opportunities are beginning to grow in the area of paid chaplaincy. Great. So I can see, so Chaplaincy Australia obviously are providing training and you're just maintaining high standards, obviously making sure these people are ready to go and they're, and they're good to go. So how long does the training typically take? I'm only saying this in case some of our listeners, I hope and pray some right. are, are now thinking, oh, I'd like to be a chaplain. So how long does the training last for? Yeah, so uh, to be a chaplain in our network, a fully fledged chaplain in our network, you have to have completed a minimum of a cert for in chaplaincy and pastoral care. Now, you can do that. We, we partner with Alpha Crucis College to do that training, but any college that offers that cert for in chaplaincy or pastoral care is our baseline as a as an entry point. But a lot of people come to us with a higher level of training. They come to us with a diploma, a higher education diploma, a degree, or even a master's now in chaplaincy and pastoral care. 
Chaplaincy um, is different to normal pastoral care. There's some nuances around it. It's different to operating within a church context. And so we need to make sure that the person who, before we let them out into the wild, if you like, we need to make sure that they're actually ready to deal with some of the challenges that come with outside the church ministry. For myself, I was a, I am and was a senior pastor of a church for 28 years. And I'm still a pastor and still involved in church ministry very heavily. But for me, there came a moment where I realized that there was a group of people outside of the church that I was never going to meet and never going to minister to. And so taking my inspiration from John uh, 10, 16, where Jesus said, other sheep there are, I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. That really inspired me to get out and to start ministering to another group of people and so I had to upskill to do that. And that's really what the chaplaincy training is about. I love that. And well done for taking that step. But okay, so just for again, for our listeners, tell us, you know, as quickly as you can or as uh, concisely as you can, what is the difference between pastoral ministry and being a chaplain? So pastoral ministry is um, absolute high level skills focusing on a group of people who want to gather in a church setting and a church context. Chaplaincy ministry are those very, very similar skills, but now being adopted and dropped into a totally different context, often one where the people actually don't have the same buy in or lean in towards the chaplain as they do towards their local minister. So there's quite a few nuances around the skills. And literally, I could talk for days about it. Yeah, but it sounds like uh, in general terms, in the church context, the majority of people you minister to are Christians already. As a chaplain, you're out there in the big wide world and the majority of the people around you perhaps don't have a faith like yours and so you're really evangelistic as well as pastoral. Would that be a fair comment? Yeah, we have to be careful with the, using the word evangelistic because chaplaincy tech is not an evangelistic ministry. It's about care and support. It's not uh, The goal of chaplaincy is not to get bums on seats or to win souls per se. It's to actually offer un. Um, um, sorry, unencumbered care and support to people in their in their time of need. Whatever they need, we provide. Now, in the op- in the process of that, we often get opportunities to share um, what we believe because people ask us those questions. But it's not what we lead with. We don't. We're not there to proselytize. We're not there to evangelize. We're there to offer care and unconditional support. Okay. Yeah, I get that. I love that. Well, that's that's wonderful. So tell us uh, some recent initiatives. I think you were with us on 2020 a couple of years ago. Have you launched any recent initiatives in those two years, Ralph? Yes. Well, a big one and really happy to to talk about this is 1-800-CHAPLAIN. It's our, our, our care line and our care line that is manned by chaplains every single day of the year. I'm really excited to be able to report that now over two years ago, we launched in November 2021, we launched 1800 Chaplain, and we've been able to provide unconditional and open support for the whole of the Australian community for the last over two years. So we've seen over 11,000 calls in that time, 15,000 hours of chaplaincy service. We've got 80 chaplains who are part of that amazing network of people. Uh, They've been specially trained, some further upskilling beyond their normal chaplaincy training so they can offer that sort of care and support. And it's been a remarkable journey and it's going well and we want to see that grow and we want to see that expand. Yeah, that's amazing. 11,000 calls in two years. I'm just doing my simple maths, Ralph. I did uh, wag a bit of school in high school, but I think that's about um, 20 calls a day. Am I right? Yeah, it's between 15 and 20 calls each day. And while that number may not seem that high, it's pretty significant in terms of people being able to reach out and connect with someone who is fully trained to provide them with uh, unconditional love, care and support in a non-judgmental way. And so we get calls from all types of people. We get calls from some people who have a spiritual faith and want to talk about spiritual things. 
but the majority of our calls are actually calling uh, for things like relationship issues. So over 26% of our calls come in where people are just trying to work out how to have relationships with another human. And uh, I think, Andrew, I don't know about you, but I think that's one of my challenges too sometimes. It's just how to get along with folk and how to actually work through some of the challenges we face. And uh, the rest of Ralph, I'll, and- I will interrupt you and say this. Yeah, I think the world would be perfect if there was no people in it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you go for a walk in the bush or on a beach, and you think, wow, God, you made such a beautiful world. And then some guy walks past you and uh, and wants to bump into you for no reason other than he's having a bad day, you know. So, yeah, I think we all need help with our relationships. We do. We do, absolutely. So but, there's so many so many good opportunities, and, and it's great to hear that people are able to talk. I, I think it's wonderful. I mean, you say 20 calls a day is not many. I think it's a lot. I mean, over a week, that's 140 calls. And is this call centre staffed uh, on during office hours or is it 24-7? What does that look like? Well, we'd like to take it further than we're currently doing. So we, we're manning the call centre uh, from 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. each day, which seems to be the peak window where people want to talk. We would like to extend that to nine, from 9 a.m. till 9 p.m., which we think is going to be a, the best catchment opportunity. So people can call in with, with minor things or significant things. We have suicide ideation sometimes call in. We have people calling in with all manner of challenge and problems. But at the moment, our finances limited us, limit us to operating six hours a day. We'd like to see that expand, and uh, we really believe in God that he's going to open up the way for us to do that. Yeah, amen. And and where does your finance come from, Ralph? Is Do you get any government funding or is it all just donation? How, how do you generate revenue? So so the, the absolute, uh, the massive majority of our funding, so 95% of our funding comes through the donations that we receive from churches, from people, individuals, and not from not from government or not from grants. We actually fall into a bit of an awkward situation here, where we're not um, we're too Christian for government funding, but we're not Christian enough for some philanthropic funding. Where because we're not openly evangelising and 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 hitting people with the Bible, we're not necessarily able to get that funding. But we sit in this interesting middle space, which which really connects people with the possibility of a loving, caring God. And for me, that's that's a fantastic space to sit in and a, a wonderful reason. And that's why I'm very, very committed and financially, personally, very, very invested in, in this activity. Yeah, well, I'm with you. It just, to me, sounds like an amazing layer of support for our society that people who are facing challenges and struggles have just got someone to talk to, someone to just... Because I don't know about you, Ralph, I think sometimes when you're struggling with something, especially internally, just telling someone about it, getting it off your chest, it's an old saying, but it's so true, you get it off your chest, and suddenly it's not as bad anymore, is it? And suddenly you can maybe think about, okay, this this isn't the end of the world, I can actually move forward from here. So I think what you guys are doing is amazing. Thanks. And look, what you're describing there, Andrew, is what I would call ventilative confession. It's this is a bi- ability to just sometimes the saying of it is actually the answer um, because sometimes you just, you just need to know there's another human listening and actually not interjecting and not trying to fix the problem. And I know for me, I come up with a whole lot of solutions sometimes when I just talk things out with a friend or my wife or, or one of my chaplain mates that I'm able to just sit down and and ventilate something that was actually eating me up, it really helps me get the help I need. Absolutely. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. So 11,000 calls in the past two years. Well, we're standing with you, Ralph, and believing and praying that, you know, in the next two years there'll be a lot more calls than that because it's it's obvious to all of us. Our society just seems to be fracturing on so many levels. So many people are struggling. But I did want to ask you, so you said relationships account for 26% of the calls. Have you got any other data on other major causes of people calling in? Yeah, yeah. So um, people calling in for just what we would classify as general pastoral care. They just want support. That sort of, hey, I'm, I'm struggling with life. Can I talk to someone? That's about 23% of people. Um, then we've got people coming in wanting to talk about their spiritual well-being in terms of, you know, sometimes they've got a challenge happening. Maybe it's a challenge at their local church or with another Christian and they don't want to necessarily bring it up in a local context. And so 
quite anonymously they can talk to a chaplain and uh, and just get something again sorted out so so that accounts for about 15 percent of our calls is that spiritual well-being people wanting prayer for something then we come into mental health issues where people are really struggling with their thinking their processing maybe they're struggling with a significant mental health condition that's nine percent and then people calling in with uh, physical health conditions too just struggling with the the challenge of pain or the challenge of limitation or disability, and that's about 6%. Um, the rest are made up of like hundreds of other sorts of things like issues with drugs, substance, uh, family housing, all sorts of things. And so really we, we try to prepare our chaplains as best we can with the gamut of all possible scenarios. Yeah, okay, I love it, Ralph. The more I hear about this, the, the more excited I am uh, on your behalf and on behalf of the organisation. Now, Ralph is also an ADF chaplain, and we are going to talk about that too after the break, but I just want to uh, let everyone know that the website, if you are getting excited about this or you're feeling your heart stirred towards Chaplaincy Australia, the website is an easy one. It's Chaplaincy Australia. Dot com. That's chaplaincyaustralia.com. So if you want to connect more to uh, to what Ralph's talking about here today, you want to get involved in chaplaincy, I encourage you to go to that website. We are going to take a break shortly, and we're going to open up the talk lines after that. So if you've got a comment you want to make, you want to ask Ralph a question about chaplaincy or maybe just some of the situations that you faced in life or you know maybe you've got a testimony that a chaplain really helped you. I know uh, my kids have gone to schools, Ralph, with chaplains there, and those chaplains have just been such a blessing, not just to my kids, but to, to the community at large. I, I'm just amazed at the work chaplains do in high schools, and uh, I'm curious to hear about the, uh, the work chaplaincies do, uh, chaplains do in the ADF as well. Now, Ralph, I also want to touch on another area that you have worked in in the past and still sort of oversee loosely, and that is the chaplaincy work in the Australian Defence Force. Tell us about your work with the ADF, Ralph, from beginning until now. Great. Well, I had the incredible privilege of becoming a army chaplain in 2009, and um, I served in uniform uh, right up until 2021, when I was given the privilege of uh, taking a leadership role as part of the Religious Advisory Council to the services, uh, where I now oversee 116 chaplains who are in the military across the three services in six different denominations. I love my work as a chaplain. I'm absolutely committed to it. I've had a fantastic military career and I, I think it's a, a brilliant ministry to think about and reflect on the impact that it makes. Yeah, now, just quote that number again. How many chaplains are you overseeing in the ADF now? So I oversee 116 chaplains. There are 330 chaplains in the Australian military. And uh, I have the incredible privilege of overseeing all of the uh, other Protestant uh, chaplains. So that's the Pentecostals, the Baptists, the Churches of Christ, the Salvation Army, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Lutherans and the uh, Salvation Army. Yeah. Sounds like you're herding cats there, Ralph. That's a, that's a very diverse group of people, but obviously united in a common cause to provide support and counselling, like you said, and just be there. We did have a guest on uh, 2020 recently who is a surgeon from the Ukraine, a Ukrainian doctor who's there uh, in the Ukrainian conflict. And I was really surprised when he mentioned how uh, necessary the chaplains are on the front lines in the Ukraine. He just said... Uh, because of the nature of the war, he said there isn't a lot of close combat. It's mainly people suffering injury through shell fire and drone attack. And it's obviously very traumatizing for the soldiers because they never know when they're going to get bombed or blown up. And then they're watching their friends get literally ripped apart. And the trauma uh, and the mental health challenges are really significant and the PTSD. And he said the chaplains are so vital to what the Ukrainian forces are experiencing on that front line. I was really surprised by that, that he placed such a value on the work of chaplains. Have you had any contact with any chaplains in that conflict out of interest? Uh, yes, I actually was speaking to a Ukrainian chaplain about uh, two months ago, and she was a uh, Come, she had come back to Australia to do some upskilling in the area of mental health training, which I was actually conducting. And um, so we spent, I bought a lunch and we, we talked for a while about some of the things she was facing. And it wasn't a surprise to me to hear 
of the issues that you've mentioned, Andrew. The, the reality is that the mental health challenges of uh, soldiers, me, women and men in combat, and even and the civilians and everyone else involved, it has a lasting impact upon their physical health, their their physical well-being, but also even in some ways, more sadly, it has a long-term effect on their mental health and their capacity. And we need to be able to provide them uh, help. And that's what the chaplains do at the coalface, right on the front line, effectively in Ukraine and in any other conflict where the chaplains are um, basically incarnated in the middle of the middle, uh, the middle of the situation, they're able to bring that love and care and unconditional support in those worst situations. Yeah, it was amazing. And, you know, Ralph, um, we, we talk about conflict and war zones and we think, oh, the, the, the stress and the pressure and the challenges there and people are suffering mental health breakdowns. But the reality is I think modern life in any westernized democracy like Australia, people are in a battle too, aren't they? There are all sorts of fights that we're involved in and people are getting burnt out, stressed out and impacted. And, uh, yeah, once again, it's just so good knowing that Chaplaincy Australia is there and there's so many good people out there providing support but we do have a caller who's called in ralph so i do want to go to him now and uh, it's richard from alstonville richard are you there uh g'day guys um i had a, just something to share and a couple of quick questions um uh, do, do you find I, I had a situation um last weekend where i was in town here i'm, I'm from the northern rivers and there was a young guy that was quite intoxicated with alcohol and he had smashed up his hand badly and he looked like he'd had a head injury and do, do you find that they, they called the police for him because they thought he might have been a threat or something do you find through working with chaplaincy there's a there's a lot more um substance of of younger men that that from one reason or another that have issues with alcohol and and abuse and things like that in your troubles? So, yeah, so, so my, my experience is that alcohol and other drugs have always been an issue in society. What we see now is a lot of people, because of what Andrew was saying before, life's complex, life is just challenging, and, and a lot of people find themselves in um, a series of scenarios that lead to a spiral downwards and can end up in them making some poor choices. The thing they don't need is our judgment. They need our help. They need our support. And and good on you for stopping, mate. Most people are a bit like in the Good Samaritan story. They're the, the Levite or the priest that walk past and get, walk away from. So good on you for stopping. Good on you for making a difference. And, and you know, if we could actually be a little bit more like that, I think uh, people would be a lot more accepting of some of the messages and the hope that we want to share with them. It's when we stand and we say, hey, you're bad, that that actually doesn't help them in the midst of the circumstance. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of people are struggling with, with substance, for sure. And um, and I'm sure Alstonville is, is, is the same as Wollongong, is the same as, as Perth and anywhere else we may find ourselves. There are people who are, who are in need of support. Mm-hmm. Well, Ralph, I'm going to ask you a question too uh, to help Richard for future reference as well. And, and it's a genuine question, Ralph. Do you think it's wise to try and speak to people when they are intoxicated or on drugs? Or do you think it's better to try and make a connection and talk to them when they've come down from the the, the impact of the substance or the, the alcohol? It very much depends on the circumstance and the conversation you're trying to have. It's it's almost pointless to try to have a meaningful, in-depth um uh, discussion with someone who is under the influence of alcohol or other drugs. The reality is, if they know you are supporting them, if they know you are de-escalating a circumstance, that helps. Um, you do have to keep your own safety in uh, in mind. Um, I don't think we need to be incredibly frightened of that, but we do need to be aware that you know violence and violent outbursts much more likely with someone who is intoxicated or under the influence of drugs than than from mental health. And so we we end up, uh, we just need to be careful, but always being kind and respectful and just giving people space. And if if you can't help, call triple zero, call the police, get get them help. And that's actually a really good 
good model is getting some help to them. Like, Richard, you noticed that he had a broken up hand and a, a bump on his head. He needed some medical attention. And so you did some great help. That was actually the help he needed. He doesn't need anything else at that moment. And help, other help can come later. Um, I just also wanted to ask, you, you mentioned that uh, you have Jewish heritage in, in um, your family and, and culture and you um, passed with some of the Jewish people. Do you, have you heard of the organisation that was putting up the, the banners and the, the pictures of the Jewish people that were um, kidnapped by Hamas in, in the, the raid in Sydney, the, the Jewish people? Do you know the name of that organisation? No, no, I don't. So I don't have any links with the Jewish community myself. I'm very good friends with a few rabbis. And um, obviously the, the challenging circumstances in the Middle East at the moment, uh, both sides of the, the both, both Palestinian and um, is, Isra Israelis are, are hurting and it's, it's mm -hmm. incredibly challenging period. And, and so I think we need to be praying and supportive of all of those that are under, under stress and under sufferance at this moment. Well said, Ralph. Hey, Richard, I want to thank you so much for calling in today. I really appreciate yeah. it. And as Ralph said, well done for, uh, for doing your best in that situation the other night that you witnessed. Yeah, cool. Thanks, guys. Bless you, guys. See you, mate. Thank you. Yeah. Very good, Ralph. And as I was saying, you know, uh, the reality is I think modern life for some people is a war zone and people are being traumatised and suffering PTSD and just stressing out for all kinds of reasons. And, and once again, it just emphasises the needs, the need for people like, you know, Chaplains Australia who provide chaplains on a phone line and face-to-face -face, and also the local churches around Australia. There's so many great support networks available, isn't there, that, uh, that people can turn to in a time of need. Totally. I was talking um, a, a while ago to the uh, chief executive officer of Lifeline, and uh, he described, um, basically, he said, there should be an ecosystem of care. And I love that phrase. It's his phrase, so I, but I've stolen it now. So there's, a, there's an ecosystem of care in our community. Churches are part of that. I think the sooner churches recognise they're not the only answer, they're part of a big answer, yeah. the more they can integrate with other, other agencies. We need incredible mental health practitioners, qualified mental health practitioners. We need social workers. You've got so much wisdom to share. And we're going to very shortly talk about having difficult conversations because I believe you've been doing some training recently in this space. Is that correct? Absolutely, Andrew. We've been we've been sort of identifying the fact, talking to uh, chaplains, pastors, leaders around the country. They've just uh, been asking a lot of questions. You know, how do you deal with the question when somebody says, and then they say something interesting, like uh, when they they don't know what gender they are, or when they're they're um, struggling with addiction or when they're dealing with domestic violence? How do you actually deal with questions around sexuality without weaponizing the scriptures and making people just uh, feel like they're falling short? How do you actually do that without compromising the general beliefs and the, the importance of, of what Christ wanted us to know? Yeah, absolutely. And and again, you know, our society, I think, is just so on edge and so tense. People, uh, it's just like we're living in a ranting society. People just want to rant. <laughs> they're ranting on social media. They're ranting in the traffic. They're ranting in the car park and the shopping center. And everyone's so on edge. I think subconsciously, all of us are kind of fearing that escalation, aren't we? That if we say something, that things are just going to escalate and get out of control. That's absolutely true. And the problem with that, of course, is if we don't say anything, people are left without any guidance, without any support, and they'll make their own decision. Uh, or they'll go and they'll interview Google and they'll talk to the rest of the world. And my observation is um, the world's a bit confused at the moment. And so maybe we need not to be asking everyone. We need to be asking a select select group of people what's actually going on so we can actually get a work through some of the challenges because some of these things need to be spoken about some of these things are things which we have actually ignored or not actually dealt with in any helpful way and people have been left with no answers whatsoever and now they're they're looking for some help yeah look you've just touched on something quite powerful there ralph because if you study like 
ancient cultures. Let's look at the ancient Jewish culture because they, they gave us the Bible. You know, they had a, a system where they were in tribal groups, they were in family groups, and each tribe had elders and leaders that effectively ran the tribe or ran the village. And there was a, a system, wasn't there, a support network of elder, older people, wiser people you could go to for help and for advice. I mean, we see this in Bible stories, like when Boaz wanted to marry Ruth. You know, what does he do? He goes to the the town, uh, the, the gate of the city, and he sits down with the elders and he gets their advice and their counsel. And I think I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, Ralph, but one thing I have done in my life is I've always... Uh, found older, wiser men than I. And when I was a pastor especially, I always found older pastors than me and I'd go to them and not tell them what I was doing, but I would ask them to tell me what I was doing and ask for their advice and their input. And I think our society's lost that, haven't they? That connection to elders, older, wiser people. We talk to the wrong people sometimes, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. And look, I'm I'm starting to move into that older age group. Um, the reality is... You don't uh, look at Ralph. You don't look at me. I'm, I'm struggling to believe that statement. <laughs> we need to be careful, though, because sometimes older means narrow and older can mean crotchety and older can be you've just got a bad attitude. And so there's a challenge for older people, uh, mature people with a lot of wisdom to actually try to understand with a bit of grace some of the challenges that young people are facing. The reality is when I grew up, there was no question around what gender was. Now, children are being brought up in a community that is actually saying gender is a complete construct of your mind and where you've come from and that you can be any gender you want. Now, the outflow of that, if we just come down hard and say, well, that's stupid, that's wrong and you shouldn't even be talking about it, it's sinful, that's not a helpful discussion. What we need to do is help people navigate that. And so we actually have to be, if we're going to be older and wiser, we need to be full of grace as well because if we don't, give gentle and and helpful discussion, we're basically just a clanging cymbal and a ringing bell and nobody likes to sit under that for too long. Yeah, that's a really good point. And spoken you know, like a man who has a very young heart. And I guess, so what's the takeaway from that, Ralph? Those of us who are over 25 and are considered old in our society, or how do we stay young in heart, Ralph? That's a good question. Well, I think, I think it's all about neuroplasticity. Now, what I mean by that is the flexibility of your brain to adopt a new concept. Um, I think we, we can become lax, and in the same way that sometimes as we grow older, we get less flexible in our physical body, we can get less flexible in our mind. What the world needs, I believe, is not just what John Lennon said is love, but uh, the we also need to have a flexibility of thinking so that we can challenge some of the new concepts and explore some of the new concepts. Like, what is a Christian response to AI? I've read the scriptures cover to cover. There's no comment in there about AI. So I have to go through that. I have to actually understand and work out, well, how, how does this outwork itself? I know that universities are really struggling with AI because now uh, people are uh, submitting um, um essays and things that have been written by computers and they're, they're really struggling with that. And so they've had to rethink the rules around that. In the same way, we have to rethink some of the negotiable aspects of Christianity. I'm not talking about the not negotiables. I'm not talking about the person of Christ. I'm not talking about the major tenets of the Gospels. I'm not talking about the, the major things of faith. I'm talking about the package that we presented in. Um, we're not singing the same songs in church that we were singing in the 60s. That's change. We're all okay with that. How about actually thinking about some of the ways we can talk about this stuff without just uh, accusing people of being ungodly because they're even asking the question? Yeah, look, that that is such a good point, Ralph. I want you to develop that further. So give me some practical examples of that. Give me a hypothetical conversation where someone's come to you and, and, and a really wise, loving, you know, caring response, but like you said, without compromising the message of Christ. Sure. So for me, Andrew, it's all about worldview. It's about understanding where they're coming from. And so if they're coming from a, a Christian worldview and you know the person and they're wanting to talk to you about gender, etc., you can start going through the scriptures with them and start pointing out because they already understand that the scriptures are important and they're valid and they're authoritarian, um, authoritative, sorry. Um, the... The problem is if you're dealing with someone in the community who's never read the Bible, never attended church, never been to Sunday school, may have a different faith 
may have no faith, and they're just coming to you with the philosophical concept that gender is not a construct that is determined by your your genetic makeup, then you're dealing with a different concept. You've actually got to take them and you've got to approach them with a bit more grace. You've got to approach them with a bit more willingness to understand that they're coming from a different perspective and you can't just, by quoting a scripture, change a mind. I believe the word of God is powerful. Absolutely. But it's powerful when it's understood. It's powerful when it's believed. It's powerful when it's acted upon. Otherwise, if it was just inherently powerful, we should just leave it running on a podcast all the time and it would solve all the problems without any of our input. It's about the application of the word and the application of help that makes a difference to lives. So true. And, you know, as you were saying that, I was thinking, well, yeah, this is what the Apostle Paul did on the Areopagus in Athens. He went to the Athenians who were not from a Christian worldview and he didn't quote one scripture, did he? You know, many of us would imagine the great Apostle Paul who wrote, you know, a lot of the New Testament, uh, preaching the Bible, telling them what, you know, that this verse, that verse. And what did he quote? He quoted their own poets. He quoted yeah. an, an altar he found, which was an idolatrous thing. And, and he, he just referred to their culture. So he sort of met them in the middle ground, didn't he? But he introduced the Lord to them in that conversation. Absolutely. And this is, um, and so in the, in the context of where Paul's teaching, where he says, to the Jew, I become a Jew, to the Greek, I become a Greek, I become all things to all men and women, so that I may, by some means, win some. And I think that's the issue. We want to be winsome. We want to actually be caring and gentle. And I actually think um, sometimes we just and, and this, this would be my, my major, um, I guess, personal statement that I'm making this, this year and, and the last 12 months, is that unfortunately Christians are being defined by what we are against rather than what we are for. People define us by the fact that you're against this or you're against that. I went to a course uh, last year and I had someone come up to me after a few days. We'd all introduced ourselves at the beginning of the course and at the end, end of the course, middle of the course she came up and she said you don't seem to be a christian you said you're a christian you don't say i was really worried that i'd done something wrong and she said and i said can you explain that to me she said well you're not against the vaccine you're not against homosexuals you're not against this you're not against that and she was defining christianity by what we're against rather than what we're for and the truth is andrew we are for some pretty cool stuff yeah. we are for joy we're for for grace forgiveness hope restoration fulfillment we're for good families we're for strong values we're for being truthful those things let's major on that let's talk about what we're for rather than what we're against and actually be defined by the goodness that god is actually showing us yeah amen it's so true i don't know if you remember an old uh, american evangelist called tl osborne but uh, he always said that too. He said, when you go to another country, don't stand there preaching against their religion or against their culture. He said, just preach Jesus, you know, and you lift up Jesus. And he said, I will draw all men unto me. And, and I adopted that. I was in a part of Africa years ago where there was a divide between the Christians in the South and uh, those of, his, of Islamic faith in the North. And whenever I went to those Northern areas, I didn't preach against their religion or their book or their Absolutely. prophet. I just preached Jesus. And I saw people come to Jesus in those settings simply because I preached the good news, not stand against the things that I didn't agree with. Yeah, absolutely, Andrew. And I think yeah, you you taking that in on in your life as a as a life motto, if you like, has actually made you much more effective than if you'd gone the opposite way. I often think of the woman at the well, and I I think in our culture sometimes the woman at the well, it's a it's a pretty normal story. Um, you know, a, a, an individual that's had five partners and the person they're living with, they're not really super committed to. That's not a dissimilar to some of the people I meet day to day. But what if that person was a different person? What if that was somebody who was struggling with gender at the world? What if that's a, a person who was a murderer at the world? What if, if it was a pedophile at the world? How would we speak to that person? How do we make the right response, the caring response? The saying difficult things sometimes, which we sometimes have to say, but we could say them in kind ways, which is the way Jesus actually operated. He said some harsh and some strong stuff, but he always did it with kindness. And the person was always left with a sense of there's love in the midst of this. And that's really what I want to lead with. 
Yeah. And it just what I'm just hearing from you today, Ralph, is it's all about love. It's having that love in your heart, that concern for people, that you're motivated not by a desire to win an argument or, or speak a truth, but actually just to, to love people and to take them on a journey and hopefully draw them to the Lord that, that we all know. That's what I'm hearing from you anyway. It's all about love, isn't it? It is, mate, yeah. Yeah, very good. So, Okay, so let's just quickly, we've got about 10 minutes, I think. Let's talk about this whole having difficult conversations because all of us face this. You know, I know there's been many times in my life where I haven't wanted to talk to someone about something, but I've known I've got to. What are a couple of takeaways you can give us, Ralph, that we can more effectively have difficult conversations? So for me, it's, it's all about preparation. It's about preparing yourself for the fact that you are going to be having difficult conversations. Now, you might know that a difficult conversation is coming up or you might just know that life's difficult and you're going to have conversations. So you need to prepare yourself by by thinking about who you are, who they are, and your relationship with the person and what you're trying to achieve. What's the goal you're trying to win? Like if you're trying to say things like, you know, if you just want to win the argument, like don't have the argument. Like if you, if the only option is for you to win, then what's the point? Um, if the point is you want to, if if you if you think the point is for them to win, there's no point having the com- the conversation. It's got to be a win win. It's got to be something that's beneficial for them and beneficial for you. And so that's for me, that's the idea of of pre- the preparation that's involved. But on top of the preparation, it's about considering and reflecting on some of the things that actually push my own buttons and I've got to be ready to I've got to be ready and willing to actually recognize that I can have bias I can have conscious bias unconscious bias it's actually quite a complicated action that's taking on so I've got to be ready and once I'm ready and once I've actually prepared myself I can then move into the conversation which should never be in anger it should never be just a fight it should be actually listening more than we speak. I found a, a, a real key in this is recognising that the question is always more powerful than a statement in terms of connection. Asking someone a question rather than telling them they're wrong. Asking them how gender fits into this and, and how does that make them feel? Does that bring them joy and peace? Rather than saying, hey, that's not the way you're going to find life. It stops me weaponizing my actions and actually leaves me with a situation where um, I've actually been helpful, which is kind of a novel idea if you think about it. You know, it's uh, helping helping people and, and letting them come to something that actually makes them feel like they've been helped rather than me feeling like I've won the argument. Or you've, or you've shouted at them. And again, it, I'll tell you what, Ralph, every time you talk, I think of the Bible. It reminds me of, uh, of Philip. He saw the Ethiopian eunuch going past in a chariot. What did he do? Did he shout at him? Did he hold up a placard? Did he say, check out my T-shirt? It says, Jesus loves you. No, he asked him a question. Didn't he? The first communication from Philip to that non-Christian Ethiopian man was, do you know what you're reading? Yeah. And yeah, it started and- a relationship, started a conversation, which ended up with the guy getting baptized and getting saved and going back to Ethiopia, having the time of his life. But even even the wording, and, and like I, I read the New King James Version, and the wording says... The Ethiopian eunuch asked the question at the end. He said, what hinders me from being baptised? Uh, so what's it, what's in the way? So Philip's obviously presented something that was breaking down all these barriers, which was fabulous. And so he asked, I don't think there's anything stopping me being baptised. And, and Philip looks at him and says, yep, there's water here. Let's do it. He baptises him on the spot. He didn't have to do anything else. And, and that's it. An unhindered gospel. That's yeah. not a bad concept. I love it. I love it. Now, I'm going to go back to your earlier point. So, number one, if we need to have a difficult conversation with people, we need to prepare ourselves and think about the scenario, think about the potential conflict that might arise. And I'll tell you what, this is gold because a lot of us, like you said, we enter into these conversations when we are heated, when we are emotional, we might be upset or annoyed or whatever it is. And emotions are never great foundations, are they, Ralph, for any decisions in life? Absolutely not. Totally not. And and the, the thing is, um, it, it's it's like a if you, if you're arguing with your spouse, okay. Uh, if you're not, li- you're generally not you're not listening because you're just planning what you're going to say next. That's that's the that's what usually what people do, and it, it, it escalates. But the it, the more you can get the emotion to drop down, 
the the more likely you are to actually get a resolution and yep. find common ground. So true. People are, people are actually wanting to find common ground. So true. Ralph, we've actually had a caller, and we do have time for a quick caller. And uh, let's see if we can just get her on the line now. Uh, is that you, Christina? Yes, that's me. Hi, how are you going? Good, Christina. Welcome to the program. What would you like to ask Ralph? Thank you, thank you. Thanks for a great program. Um, I've got a bit of a dilemma, and I just want to – I've got two questions on it. Um, I'm currently studying a diploma in counselling, and um, I'm nearly finished with it. But I just uh, – I keep on learning about, you know, being non-judgmental and moving your values to the side. But being a Christian, I still have, you know, really strong Christian values. And I would love to engage in a in a helping position once I'm finished with my mama studies. But um, what's so interesting is when I listen at chaplaincy, I, I'm like, that is maybe a good answer for me because... I can still, you know, practice my my values, my Christian values, but in a way where I can support people. So I just want to know, basically, what is the future for chaplaincy? Um, because we live in such a secular world. Um, yes. So, That's a question. Reality, <laughs> great question. The, it's a huge question. The reality is that uh, chaplaincy is emerging in many areas, but it's also under threat from uh, critics who would say that chaplaincy has no, there's no place for religious chaplaincy in a secular community. And so there yes. is a contested space. But that being said, chaplaincy done well is its own ambassador. And organizations yes. that have experienced chaplaincy done well want more of it and so there are some opportunities emerging christina for some professional opportunities and paid roles in chaplaincy and what i'd encourage right. you to do right. is connect with your state leader for chaplaincy australia and just uh, yes. if you just go to our website and um they'd be able to have a longer conversation with you and maybe help you navigate what some of those sectors are like and you can engage with some of their professional development and actually even yep. connect yeah. And, and make some connection. Now, you said you had a second question? Uh, no, I can't remember. I think you've answered most of what I was looking for. But, yes, no, that, that's very interesting. And um, I would definitely have a look at the website and yeah, give no, them a ring. Right. Hey, Christina, really glad that you called in today and I uh, wish you all the best with that journey you're on to. You obviously have relocated to Australia here from South Africa originally. I'm, I'm hearing in your accent there. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, well, that's right. Yep. Buramaka Plan, you just keep charging on there. <laughs> and uh, for those listeners who don't know any Afrikaans, that means the farmer has a plan or the farmer makes a plan. <laughs> and it's the, uh, it's the motto of the South Africans, just make things work. But God bless you, Christina. That's Thank you for the call. Lovely. And we genuinely wish you all the best on that journey. Awesome. Thank you so much for a great program. Thank you. Well done, Ralph. Thank you for that answer, mate. And uh, we are actually running out of a time today, but I want to remind our listeners today that your website is chaplaincyaustralia.com. It's an easy one, chaplaincyaustralia.com. And Ralph, I just want to thank you, not only for your time today, but for the work you're doing. I mean, you are just such an ambassador, a great ambassador for Chaplaincy Australia. You're just so full of life and energy. And for the listeners uh, who are just listening, I'm watching this guy on the Skype today and he's just smiling the whole time. He's so full of energy and joy. Obviously so passionate about what he does. And Ralph, is there any closing thoughts or statements you'd like to make before we finish up today? I just want to encourage every person that's listening that we can all make a difference. We can all actually help someone else today. You don't have to do any special training. Just actually uh, listen Smile, uh, pay attention, and don't push your agenda. Actually see what they might need, and you might actually be able to help. Seriously, if you're interested in becoming involved with Chaplaincy Australia, we would be delighted to have you. We need more chaplains. We need people who are working um, the phones at 1-800-CHAPLAIN. Uh, we need people to use the service or, or remember the number so that you can tell someone else when they're in need. And uh, it's been a blessing to be with you, Andrew. Thanks for your time. And I'd love to help out any time or come back on the program whenever I'm invited. Well, you will be invited back. And we just pray that Chaplaincy Australia just grows and grows and grows. And especially that, that uh, 1-800 call line. I just love the whole concept of that, that that also expands and has a greater influence in Australia in the years ahead. Once again, Ralph, thank you for your time today. No worries, Andrew. Thank you and God bless. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.